Yes, um, I was writing this book and then I realized that I ha first had to understand the past, what happened in the 90s, and explain to people that there, there was, that it is, is possible to have an internet which is not based on surveillance capitalism, or that, you sh that it's not true that using the internet means that you lose your privacy. It's, it's really not necessary. It's not in the technology itself. It's how it's designed to do to benefit for, for, for again, the business models. Um, but then I had to do some soul searching. Do I really think we can fix it? Because it's, you know, where are we? It's quite complex and, uh, yeah, and difficult. So, but I thought, yes, the, the, you see, I think that there, are, there are different levels that we have to act. And one of them is legislation. Uh, the other is, is education, understanding, capacities, competences so that people don't fall for the wrong um, um, uh, mirrors and, and nice presence, presence and nudging and so on. Hi, welcome to the show. My pleasure to be here as your host. Just call me T+. This show is called Inno Minds, a forum for leaders in tech and politics to discuss how to solve today's problems with today's tools. Today, our special guest Marlene Sticker is the director of WOG Future Lab in Amsterdam. I'm also here with Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister. Today, we talk about how to empower society to become more resilient against big tech dominance, how to bring public values back to the digital domain, and what knowledge we need to deal with technological challenges. Okay, so before we get started, I want to introduce our two guests today. Hailing from the Netherlands, Marlene is a professor of practice at the Amsterdam University of Applied Science. She's also the co-founder and director of WOG Future Lab, a research institute for creative technology and social innovation. Her credo is if you can't open it, you don't own it. Hi Marlene, welcome to the show. It's very early in the morning in Amsterdam. Yes, but it's sunny and a very nice day, so happy to be here. Audrey Tang is Taiwan's digital minister. She became Taiwan's youngest minister without portfolio in 2016 when she headed the public digital innovation space. She has been a hacktivist for over two decades. She is also a promoter of open source innovation. Hi, Audrey. Yes, and good local time, everyone. Marlene, it's fair to say that you've been a pioneer in the cyberspace as you founded the first virtual community introducing free public access to internet in Amsterdam in 1993. I think both of you, Audrey and Marlene, see the 1990s as a pivotal decade, but perhaps for different reasons. Marlene, how did you view the emergence of internet? And how did you go so far ahead of your time? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, here in the Netherlands, I'm known as a, a, an internet pioneer. That's a category in itself. If you if you were there acting and, and developing in the early 90s, um, at that moment, it was still possible to shape the applications on the internet, like the basic infrastructure was there. Uh, and with a lot of people here in Amsterdam, we already had a culture of experimentation with uh, television, radio, uh, interactive formats. So a lot of artists, hackers, and people who are socially uh, active were already working on all kinds of types of media. And then we got grip on the internet, which was, of course, a very good way to, to distribute, to find new people, to communicate. So we have, we have, I have started the Digital City as a platform, a social media platform, Avant Lettre, in 1993. And uh, from there, we have been an active community of people really creating things. And I think that, uh, that moment in time was very special for everybody, uh, feeling that the internet became matured, uh, also on the concepts that we have uh, formulated in the early days. Audrey, you've talked about the 1990s as a period of anarchic joy and endless possibilities. In hindsight, what attributed to this freedom? Was it the result of lack of regulations at the time? Uh, I would say that uh, because Taiwan is the place of uh, IBM PC compatibles, uh, meaning that a lot of different manufacturers can try out different designs and they're compatible uh, with each other in personal computing. So in Taiwan, there was widespread access to personal computers. My first um, experience with the internet was also in 1993. I was 12 years old at the time. Uh, and uh, we were uh, already 
having a culture of dial-up BBS. So the systems that people set up at their own home computers for other people to dial in with telephones and so on. So the telephone bill uh, of my uh, family's household at that time was astronomical because I was just dialing to all those the different BBS at that time. And along comes the internet where we can actually experience uh, this network of BBS sites online and there's no uh, busy tone anymore. <laughs> Anyone can connect to any site uh, regardless of how many lines they have actually in physical layer. So it does create a flowering, uh, a blooming uh, of uh, anarchistic exploration. And at a time, I think we're very much on the frontier. The government doesn't even know uh, how to put this into legal terms and so on. So the anarchistic joy is uh, twofold. First is that there was no top-down way to prescribe how the internet works. And also we feel like law makers. Like anytime we create a protocol, this becomes the physical law upon which the internet almost um, is wired in uh, to the internet fabric itself. So I work on the RSS, ATOM syndication, and many of the earlier uh, web log at the time, uh, cultures and protocols. Being one of the first to experience such an adventure must have been exhilarating. Marlene, in 2019, you published a book called The Internet is Broken. But we can fix it. As far as you are concerned, when was the turning point in the misuse of internet? Yeah, I think it started very early on. <laughs> um, and it has been recognized um, by, uh, by people. Uh, it's not just that it happened with Facebook or uh, with, with, the, with Cambridge Analytica, because that's really late that people got awareness of what was happening of the, the changing business models um, uh, behind, underneath the, the surface. But I think it started already already in the 90s where uh, the discussion was immediately, we only want to have the best of the internet, which was a political choice. So it was not just like a neutral network. It, it was, it, the, and net neutrality was a very important uh, topic at that moment already. But it was already a lot of fighting about how, what to, to have a say about the internet, how it would function, how it would work inside of countries and, and so on. Um, but also companies very early on started to, 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 to get in uh, and try to shape it. Also in, in the, the internet uh, task force, for example, the places where governance and protocols were negotiated and discussed. So before it was really an open, it was like the beauty of the network. Uh, it should function like net neutrality was central. And then other things became central. For example, business models. Said it made, it made a very clear distinction. It's, it's at the moment that we, uh, we as people, our data becomes, um, um, comes, what, it becomes uh, for sale. When our identities, our actions, our behavior becomes the business model. And this is somewhere in 2004 when it really goes wrong. But before that already, uh, we forgot that the internet should have been taken care of as a public domain. And everywhere we, we, I went, people saw, saw it as a marketplace, as something that the market will do it for us. And the government really stepped back instead of uh, taking care of that part of the internet that should have been uh, ruled as a public domain. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I was briefly uh, in the Silicon Valley uh, at, around the end of the 90s, uh, and the conversation at the time was very much how to reconcile right, the free software movement, which is uh, essentially a rights movement uh, about digital rights, uh, and the uh, business models of the Silicon Valley, exactly as Marlene have said. Uh, we have worked on, at the time, of course, the term open source, which is a reconciliatory language language that tries to shift a rights-based movement into a utility-based movement, uh, as well as many um, like Mozilla and so on um, efforts uh, to take what used to be proprietary uh, surveillance uh, extracting models and try to develop business models that is more uh, rights-preserving uh, or even rights-affirming. 
Uh, and then I went back to Taiwan uh, to start uh, a few movements and working with our National Academy uh, on Open Foundry, which is a place uh, that translates the Creative Commons uh, and provide uh, source code hosting and things like that uh, to just like GitHub today, but not run by Microsoft, <laughs> but by run by the National Academy. So I think uh, around uh, the turn of the century in Taiwan, at least, we're already very consciously preserving what's called the social sector or the public domain, the commons. Uh, that is the internet because we are already uh, feeling the danger of the transnational um, big tech entities trying to take away this freedom of innovation. Yes, maybe, maybe to add, I think that that is really marvelous because only now people start to realize that we are have to deal with something like a commons, that the whole notion of commons is returning into the economic debate, but it has been lost for, for decades because yeah, a new neoliberal frame that, that, that the government should do anything. So this one of the narratives is that the government don't understand, so they should stay away. Uh, cyberspace is for, for the new people. Uh, there's no power, it's, it's anarchistic. But of course, there were all kinds of powers inside of the networks. Somebody owns the cables, somebody owns the routers. So the idea that the internet has been like a space without rules has never been the, the case. So we better understand it as a place with rules, but then yeah, we have to, to define them uh, together. And what I think is one of the problems at the moment is still is that the, the understanding of technology is so lacking in, in a lot of areas in our society that people feel only a consumer. They don't even know how to, to they, they think it comes from God or it comes in the clouds. They're all kind of, this are kind of metaphors that people don't really see it as something that you could rule or have rules for it. I'm not sure if you still, maybe that's the difference maybe in Taiwan, especially mm -hmm. with you, you also as a minister of digital affairs, mm -hmm. you're very knowledgeable, but in the Netherlands, that's still a problem. It, it's, it's, it's the, the gaining knowledge more and more uh, in the, our parliament, our lawmakers, but it's really difficult to get them uh, up to speed. Mm. Yeah, there's, um, I think in Taiwan, we emphasize this hands-on maker culture, right? So uh, not just people generally uh, is able to repair personal computers uh, since the 90s, but also we see that the government regulations doesn't have to be a top-down thing that prohibits particular uses, but we do see that we can subsidize and make grants and so on uh, for the commoning uses. And I think this realization that the commons doesn't need to be a state apparatus. It's just like uh, scientific funding, right? It's exactly like scientific funding in that it's published so that uh, everybody can enjoy, but it's they need to guarantee a, a certain influx of energy and resources so that people don't just go away to the commercial sector to innovate. Yes, and, and the maker skills within society is something, is that something you do within the school system or? Mm -hmm. In the, in the cultural system, mm -hmm. how do you, mm -hmm. how, how is that being organized? Yeah, so uh, of course the maker culture is both hardware and software. The hardware, uh, we've uh, made sure that like 3D printing, uh, like um, easy to make uh, CNC uh, modes and uh, so on, fab labs and so on, are generally available uh, in basic education. In fact, uh, in 2019, we switched our basic education to replace all the occurrences uh, of the word literacy into competence because literacy oh. is when you consume uh, and competence is when you make uh, and we extended that metaphor from hardware to also software and especially around IoT devices. So instead of uh, just uh, subscribing the weather uh, from the clouds, uh, instead uh, people are encouraged to measure their own uh, micro weather stations like air pollutions and so on. And each and every uh, basic education school had those air boxes where people can measure the air quality together and they can also fact check together and so on. So the basic idea is that once you stop evaluating on the standardized answers uh, that requires memorization and so on, but instead rate the class outputs uh, by the social impact that they have through the commons, then it changes the way that the teachers interact with the students. 
Yes, very nice. Very much in line with, with our philosophy. We have a fab lab. We do teacher maker camps. Yes, very much uh, alike. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's good to see concrete achievements in empowering the younger generation. Fast forward to today, Marlene, you're not just making a statement about the internet's problems. You propose solutions. Can you tell us more about the Fix the Internet initiative? Yes, um, I was writing this book and then I realized that I had first had to understand the past, what happened in the 90s, and explain to people that there, there was, it is, is possible to have an internet which is not based on surveillance capitalism or that you should, the, that it's not true that using the internet means that you lose your privacy. It's, it's really not necessary. It's not in the technology itself. It's how it's designed to do, to benefit for, for, for again, the business models. Um, but then I had to do some soul searching. Do I really think we can fix it? Because it's, you know, where are we? It's quite complex and, uh, yeah, and difficult. So. But I thought, yes, the, the, you see, I think there are, there are different levels that we have to act. And one of them is legislation. Uh, the other is, is education, understanding, capacities, competences, so that people don't fall for the wrong um, um, uh, mirrors and, and nice present, presence and nudging and so on. Um, but in regulation, we see that uh, in Europe, of course, uh, the GDPR, privacy law, has been in place for a while. Uh, we, we now will have the Digital Service Act, the Digital Market Act, the AI Act. These are always uh, all laws to, to regulate. At first it was like, well, Europe is stupid, they don't know anything, the Silicon Valley, uh, all kinds of other places have more, more knowledge about this. But I think it, it does work, in, not enough, not, not near enough, but it's, it definitely works because Companies uh, have to, to adjust, but also national um, um, uh, rulings can, can be in place. Um, and I think slightly the whole narrative about uh, design, uh, privacy by design, uh, we are not a product, we are not raw material, uh, those kind of things start to, 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 to become a bit more real. But again, I think regulation is definitely necessary. We do this with food, we do this with pharmacy, we do this with everything. It's really weird that when it comes to AI or data or digital, we believe that the government should stay away. Because we don't say that when it's, when it's about food regulation, we don't say it when it's about uh, the pharmaceutical industry, we, we hyper-regulate those kind of areas. Audrey, do you think it is possible to turn the internet back into a common good? Well, the internet started as a common good, and there's always parts of the internet. Uh, think of Wikipedia, for example, that has always been in the commons. We don't need to recapture <laughs> Wikipedia from the dot-com uh, people. They uh, stayed at dot .org uh, all these years. Uh, so I think this recapturing or fixing narrative is really about mind share. This is about if a person want to work on the internet, work on a startup, on a new team, a social entrepreneur, for example, whether they see the duck org way of working uh, is an equally viable or even more desirable way uh, of working. Because as we know, that org uh, organizes people together and everybody who are involved uh, has a say, right? Nothing about us without us. Whereas the dot com uh, is basically voting by shareholders, uh, meaning that each dollar speaks uh, instead of each person. So uh, different ways of organization lead to different incentives. And I think part of this uh, mindset recapturing is just to explain that if you do have privacy by design and if you co-create a service together this service tends to provide much more value and to the dot com way if they do not work with the dot org way it end up polluting the commons so i totally agree with marlene right the, um, i think the environmental regulations or the food and drug regulations part of that is about pollution control um, earlier on uh, in the 70s for example there was a concerted push right for the refrigerators to switch uh, from freon to something that doesn't damage the ozone but that was because people learned about that ozone is a commons and if it's destroyed uh, everybody get cancer right so just by 
changing the narrative about refrigeration is so good, uh, we need to pay some price to enjoy refrigeration, into, well, refrigeration is important, but the commons are even more important. I think we'll be able to convince more innovators that they can still innovate, actually they can innovate more uh, with the kind of EU-led legislations, because within that constraint, there's more need for co-creation in the .org way. I also think that, that it's also an opportunity for new actors and new players to, to enter the field. Because now it's, very, it's dominated by big tech and it's no way to compete on their business model. So actually legislation opens up the market again for innovators that, that take the common serious and, and are organized in a way as you just described. Um, so I think next to regulation we need building new applications that we need in a way that, that is non-extractive, where, where no value is being extracted, no data is extracted, that, that is regenerative. And I think that counts for the whole economy. We, the, the, the internet and the tech is not separated from all the other questions that we have in the planet, and, and um, not in the least because of the, the climate um, effect, the um, CO2 uh, effects of, of the industry itself, the IT industry, the data and the data centers itself. So I think we, we start to finally get a more serious debate on where are we optimizing for what, what, and, and who is actually designing it. We, I think that this part is also like, are, are enough people aware and willing to, 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 to make this step to, to join that movement, which is based on commons, open source, and I think we can be happy that things like Signal exist and they show a an, an next cloud. They, ex they show us that it's possible to have really optimal services, but based on different ideology or different ideas about value. Yeah, indeed. Um, I want to uh, quote a conversation I just had uh, this morning uh, with the jury panel of the presidential hackathon, which is an activity in Taiwan where we ask people cross sectorally to co-create commons and five teams each year receive the presidential award to dedicate the resources and the regulatory and personnel required to make it into national policy. So it's a way for local innovators to turn their idea into national policy. And this year, there's many uh, teams that has generative AI as part of their um, ideas. Uh, and uh, part of the jury's our conversation was that, of course, uh, we should provide a national uh, foundational model, release it as open source, like Apache license and so on, uh, because otherwise, each and every team will have to do the pre-training or at least some of the language specific fine-tuning themselves, and that is bad for the planet. So I think just having this... Uh, general idea of a carbon budget and the open source as a way to reduce the environmental footprint and uh, the reducing the harm on the planet makes the two conversations around digital and green conversations together and we can reuse the language throughout. Yes, very interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Striking a balance between digital development and environmental protection has become more crucial than ever before. But let me ask you something. Isn't overregulation of emerging technologies a threat to innovation? Well, I think, I think this is one of those narratives that's being repeated and repeated over again. And I don't think it's true because we, are, we have a regulated food, mar food market and still there are innovations. We have a regulated pharmacy market and still we have innovation. So I don't, I don't even see the argument. I don't think it's, it, it, it's valid. Um, and the other side is that uh, yes, I think restraints can open up new alleys, can, have, can open up um, the, the floor for other actors in that field with other ideas about innovation, about other types of services maybe, otherwise how it would function. So I think, I think it's, it, it's I, don't, I don't believe the argument, and I think restraints can help us to innovate. And I think we have planetary boundaries, we have social justice, those are we, we can negotiate those, and that would be really stupid. So if we want to be in a safe space as humanity and bring more people in a safe space, which is not the case at the moment, we have to take those boundaries serious and see them as, as design principles for innovation. And I, I really, I'm really sure that many people will step in if they understand that this field is open for them and not dominated by a few actors. 
In Taiwan, we already passed the laws uh, in our parliament this year that put a much stricter penalty for the interactive deepfakes. So granted, it's one part of generative AI, it's not everything, but we already see uh, scammers use the voice cloning for fraud, uh, synthetic porn, uh, meddling with elections and so on. And I think there is a consensus really among all jurisdictions that there is no pro-social innovation in interactive fraud of deepfakes. So, uh, of course, we stifle uh, the scamming, but I, I don't think this is a, uh, a right narrative because, uh, of course, part of the society relies on the coordination between people who are not in the same room, like we're not in the same room now. Uh, but if the, the interactive scamming renders it very difficult for us to trust any video conferencing system uh, to not be hijacked and so on, then international coordination would not be possible, right? So I think these guardrails are in place, not because uh, we want to regulate the technologies itself, like we want to regulate um, relational database, of course not that, but we do want to regulate the uh, abuse that are already showing harm to the society. I don't think there's any uh, argument against that in our parliament. No, I, I, I totally agree. I, th I think it's... Um, we have fundamental rights. We have... Uh, well, it, I, think, I think any innovation strategy should be based on explicit values, that you ex make explicit what your values are. And... Um, we, as in the Waag, we developed this notion of the public stack, that in each of the layers of the technology, this public value should be present, also in hardware and operating systems and the applications and, and anything. But it's, so it means that you have to, instead of a lot of this, um, we, we not talk about bias in, in, in uh, AI or bias in, uh, in code and data. I think that's a very essential discussion because a lot of people don't even understand that data is not neutral and software is not neutral. If then as, a, as, as a, an instruction is not a neutral thing, somebody designed it, it's man-made, woman-made, uh, it's, it's created. It's, it's a, these are cultural artifacts which also describe our belief systems, what we think is important. So at the moment that you de decide to make something data, that is a, that, that is an, decision made, somebody is responsible, other data is not there. So you can't work with the data which is not being created. So in that sense, any part of the technology, the technology is not a neutral thing. And I think it's important to have that discussion before we just uh, sort of act as if it's there as a coming from, I don't know, somewhere, but, and it's not man-made. I think it helps us to, uh, to, to optimize for what we want, what we want to, to achieve. So I don't think in any innovation, we talk about transformative innovation, we talk about the transitions that we need to go through and the innovation we need for that. So yeah, I think, I think it's, it's much better to have a more co-creational innovation culture than one which is dictated or defined by shareholder value. I understand that you believe in co-creation and bottom-up approaches to innovation. How do younger generations respond to these values? Yes, for me, that's, that's really important. I, I love the way that, or the, how you said that it's not about literacy, but about competences. And I think that is so true. Uh, 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 those people, like, if you have um, literacy, you can read, but you cannot execute. I think competences, I have also, uh, uh, the, the book, uh, The Internet is Broken, at first I wanted to call it Read, Write, Execute. So you can read, you can write, but who has the X? Who can execute? So I think... It's important to, for this generation, but also anybody, also older people, should have an understanding what it, does, what it means when you, when you are a cable, uh, able to execute a program, which is also a metaphor. It's not just that everybody should learn to code. It's also understanding what code is and how it works in our society and how normal processes are being taken over by software and what that, does that mean when there are no humans in the loop. And yes, there, there, I feel very, the whole uh, University of Applied Science is very open for this. So we, we uh, did an online course, uh, opened up an online course, a MOOC on public stack, a minor as a program. And yeah, we're going to continue this. So, and it's, it's a collaboration both on, on the education, but also on the research and also on the internal operation. How, how can a big educational institution 
uh, become part of this um, commons movement and, and get out of their, 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 they're very trapped at the moment in a lot of the technology that they use, they don't even know where the data goes. They, they can't really protect their teachers and their, their educators and their, and their students. So also on the operational side, it's very interesting to work with them. So I uh, just check out, as Marlene was mentioning, publicstack.net, which I believe is a very important uh, resource. Uh, and I saw that it listed many public spaces, uh, including Foundation for Public Code, which I'm an international advisor on. Uh, and I think this idea of public space is really crucial. Uh, earlier in this uh, season, we talk about uh, digital public infrastructure, digital public goods, and so on, but we haven't explored the idea of digital public spaces. We understand the private sector spaces as the one that are co under constant surveillance, right, by companies and so on, but we're not talking about government spaces, where the surveillance is done by the government instead, right? So how is public space different from the private sector spaces? Yes, I think the notion <clears throat> of public space is uh, exactly uh, trying to define that it's not either the government or the company that is in charge, but society itself can organize itself. Of course, governments always have to set the rules, so it's not that they're not there, that they're, they're not necessary. But public spaces, here in the Netherlands, uh, it's... Um, Actually, the digital city was a public space. Mm -hmm. It started. A lot of people uh -huh. remember it as something which wasn't a, a, a public space. Uh, but then, of course, over the years, that changed. And now, especially in the cultural sector, a lot of organizations, media organizations, uh, broadcasters, theaters, festivals, they started talking with each other, saying, how is it possible that we are public organizations? Uh, we want to have a, a good conversation with our is our audience mm -hmm. participation as well. And why are we doing this on these platforms that we don't trust? Mm. Why do we invite people on platforms that we don't trust? And we almost make it necessary that they have a, a Facebook account or an Instagram or a Twitter account or so on. Mm -hmm. So this, this started with that. And then, so the public spaces is also a big conference now, which is, addresses this, not just in the Netherlands, but in Europe. Europe, there are a lot of people engaged in creating this new type of spaces, which in the end means that the software is not, uh, is not preparatory, it's open, it's open technology. And I think we have seen a very interesting version of that uh, with the, the whole chaos around Twitter, mm -hmm. that a lot of, a lot of people move to Mastodon, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. a, a, a federated um, a social media, pla not a platform, a network. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly people realize it's possible. So again, uh, PeerTube as an alternative for YouTube, which is also based on the same sort of uh, federative uh, protocol. I think we, we go back to this idea of federation mm. uh, as a way to have more multiple like owners or people that are responsible for, for uh, the conversations that we have. And it has been a really crazy idea that people in the Silicon Valley should define the rules for the world conversations. Mm. It's, it's still... That must have that in, in the end, in, in a few years, people will say that was a really stupid idea. Right, so it's the community that participates, sets the rules, and the government just upholds the place uh, to make sure that the citizens can govern those rules themselves. I think this is a really good uh, exposition. Thank you both for your insights. We've been talking about the need to reappropriate the technologies we use. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, share, and let us know what you think. See you next time on Innovative Minds. I think the, the feathers of internet, the, the, the Fediverse as it's being called, um, is definitely uh, a fragmentation um, on the one hand. So it helps to, 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 to organize yourself in a better way, um, have more ownership about the rules of moderation, um, also not depending on um, extractive business models. So I think, I think yes, that, so that is definitely a very good example of fragmentation. On the other hand, which I think is still really very smart and, and needed, is that they are still connected. So it's, it's not a fragmentation, which is, means that you can't find all the other people with the hashtag that also are interested in something that's happening at that moment or uh, a theme which you are interested in. So, 
if you want, you can go out and meet all these other people, communicate with them, but it's not something that is already been decided for by somebody else that you don't even uh, uh, um, have any say about. A lot of people don't even know how their news feed is being organized. Like, why do I don't see the the postings of my friends, but I do see the postings of all kind, Elon Musk all the time. <laughs> um, so it, it's clear that the algorithms don't really help us to find the people that we really want to have the conversation with. I'm Rene Sticker, I'm director of Bath Future Lab. See you on Time One Plus. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. See you on Taiwan Plus.